Happy Victory Sunday, everybody. Welcome into the Pack-A-Day podcast. My name is Andy Herman. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to join me here on YouTube. Going to be going over the Packers' victory over the Carolina Panthers. Uh, they win 24-16 to with the same exact uh, score as they beat the Panthers by last year in 2019, also at Lambeau Field. So somewhat interesting there. Vegas had it as an eight-point game. The Packers win by eight points. So I know that this feels like a disappointing victory. In fact, uh, Aaron Rodgers basically described it as that, a, a disappointing victory after the game. And I think rightfully said that this is not playoff caliber caliber football. You know, they're going into the playoffs in, in a few weeks. They know they're going to be there. And this is not a performance that's going to get the job done. He knows that. The team knows that. Matt LaFleur knows that. I wrote in my, my recap for Packer Report, uh, which will be up at 9 a.m. on Sunday, uh, that this game echoed, I felt, a lot of the Jacksonville Jaguars game earlier this year. Two different scripts to the game. In this game, the Packers go up 21-3 to and kind of hold on for the victory against the Jaguars. Uh, they were actually down in the fourth quarter in that game and actually needed to overcome and, and go down in the fourth quarter and try and win that game, which of course they did. But it was interesting that in both of those games, if you go and listen to the press conference, it felt like a loss. Matt LaFleur, Aaron Rodgers, and, and the players after the game just talking about it, it really felt like the Packers lost those two games rather than won both just because of the level of play. I, I think it really felt like they played down to their opponent rather than, you know, the all gas, no break mantra that Matt LaFleur wants and really just kind of, you know, really just uh, stepping on the opponent's neck and, and, you know, ending it right then and there. When the Packers went up 21 to three, you know, they had the ball back, you know, to end the half. They were going to get the uh, ball back to the start the second half. You're thinking at that time, all right, Green Bay could potentially go up 35 to three and end this thing, you know, before it even gets started. Heck, even a couple field goals or one touchdown on one of the two drives. And you're looking at a four possession game and, uh, you know, really in, you know, massive control of that football game. So, it was disappointing in a lot of different ways in the fact that, you know, Green Bay just kind of let the Panthers get back into it. That's kind of been the MO for the Packers all season long. Something that, again, if they don't correct at some point is probably going to bite them in the playoffs. But I thought there were a lot of positive takeaways in this game too. And, and what I really want the main takeaway to be here is every game has its own script. Every game is going to be a degree of difference. Even if you, you know, how many games have we seen over the years where it's two high powered offenses facing off against each other and it's a defensive struggle or two great defenses and there ends up being way more points than you expect. You know, just every game is going to have its own unique structure. And I think the question all season long has kind of been, if the Packers get into games where the offense doesn't put up 30 points, can they still be successful? And in fact, the Packers had three games coming into this game in which they didn't score 30 points, and they were one and two in those games. The only win was against the lowly Jacksonville Jaguars who have one win on the season. So the question was, could, could Green Bay's defense and special teams win them a game if the Packers offense isn't isn't up and running on all cylinders? Up until this point, the answer was kind of no. It even took a, a really late fourth quarter drive against the, the one in what, 12 Jaguars at this point, you know, to, to win that game. So this was a really good step in the right direction for the defense and to some extent the special teams that, you know what, if things aren't perfect, they can still win that style of football game. Now, will it be the same against the, the Rams or the Buccaneers or uh, a team that's much better, the Seahawks, etc.? the Saints? Probably not. If, if they play a game like this, is it going to be good enough? Probably not. Is the defense going to hold up to the level it did against the, the Panthers? Probably not. But I still thought it was a very good step in, in a solid direction to say, you know what, it doesn't always have to be the offense. And the mark of a really good team is being able to, to win some of those games where you don't have your A plus effort, where you're playing at maybe a C, C minus, and you don't have your best thing going for you if your offense isn't clicking on all cylinders, and you still find ways to win that game. That's a mark of a strong football team, of a sound football team, not a, a fraudulent football team or anything like that. So I, I think there's positives to take away here. You want to be able to win all different sorts of games, whether it's a high scoring shootout, whether it's a defensive struggle, whether it's somewhere in the middle, whatever it is, you want to be able to show that you can win those games. And I thought Green Bay won a game that didn't go anywhere near their script. They had the opportunity early to put it away. They couldn't. Again, that's been something that's been going on all season long, but I still think that you can take away some positives from this game. And when you look at it long-term, when you look at a, a potential playoff and, and potential Super Bowl run, 
what you're looking at from the team is you know that you're you're going to have to play your best football and you have to string together three or four games that are of your best possible football. And we still haven't seen, I don't think, the Green Bay Packers put together a full game. But you, what you want to see throughout the season is different things that show you, all right, we've seen the offense perform at an incredibly high level. All right, so if, if, they, if the offense can play at that point, that, that offense has the ability to make a run. You want to see stretches throughout the, the season where the defense plays at a high level. Now, I'm not sure that this game you know really amounts to a high level, but 16 points allowed, you what, three sacks, a major forced fumble. Um, I thought they did a pretty good job in this game. And if you kind of go back to end of last year and combine it with this year, we've seen this team be able to get a ton of pressure with Kenny Clark, Preston Smith, Zedarius Smith. I thought Preston Smith looked better today. I thought the coverage for the most part, Sands Kevin King, which I'll get into in just a moment, looked better today. And that's what you want. You want everything to show that it can be done. And then it has to all kind of come together at the same time. So I thought this was a positive step for the defense. You still have Mason Crosby completely kicking ass, uh, has made every single field goal. I thought that that 51 yarder was just such a clutch play because it comes off of a sack. And sometimes I know you you can argue whether momentum's real or not, but when you have a, a sack right before that, and it just kind of sucks everything out, it sucks the life out of the team. For Mason to come in and just drill a 51 yarder anyway, in December, in the cold, at night, it was just such a clutch play by Mason Crosby. So I thought there were some really solid things. And within the play of that defense, I thought two players in particular, you know, really stood out for their performances. I thought Adrian Amos uh, was one of them. You know, he has what, three pass deflections. He had a sack on the day. And then he, you know, he, I think he had like six or seven tackles. I and mean, he was just all over the field. I think he actually downed a punt on special teams at one point as well. And he's a player, I, I thought he struggled a little bit against the Lions last week, but I thought over the course of the last couple of months, he's played really, really good football. And I just think he and Darnell Savage are really playing off of each other well. And I think that's something that's really come together and gelled over the course of the last couple of months. And I think Adrian Amos is playing at a really high level. And I think this was probably, I'll be excited to watch the tape, but I think this was probably his best game of the season. And then Chris Barnes, Green Bay made a conscious decision that Chris Barnes was going to be the guy in the middle of the defense in this game. They gave him the green dot. They made him the person who was going to be communicating all the play calls. They knew that this was going to be a Chris Barnes game. And that in and of itself is a story. They moved Christian Kirksey more to Will Linebacker, which Matt LaFleur mentioned after the game when I kind of asked him about it. But this was a conscious effort to get Chris Barnes on the field more. And again, that, that in and of itself is a story, but when you go out and you ball out and you have a really good game, including a massive force fumble, which Matt LaFleur called the play of the game because it was the play of the game. I mean, he went all Dikembe Mutombo at the goal line. You might as well have just waved his finger, uh, wagged his finger, I guess. But that, it was an amazing play from a rookie, uh, a rookie undrafted free agent who, in my opinion, assuming he's healthy, uh, it should be the inside linebacker going forward for the Green Bay Packers. I thought that was a massive performance from Chris Barnes and one that he earned this week and should earn the starting job moving forward as well. If you want to look at uh, the defining um, you know, feature of this game or statistic of this game that really swung the balance. You know, of course, you can always look at turnovers, right? The, the fact that the Packers got the turnover and then the, the Panthers did not is definitely one, but this was really red zone, right? The, the Packers get three trips to the red zone only, but they make the most of it and get three touchdowns, 21 points in their three red zone trips. The Carolina Panthers get five red zone trips, which if you think about it, the worst case scenario you, you're thinking there is 15 points, which would be a bad day. And Green Bay allowed 16 points in the red zone on five trips. So, uh, I mean, if, if those are five touchdowns, that's 35 points. Green Bay is not coming back from that. You know, so I, and if Green Bay on the same thing, if, if you kick three field goals, they're probably not coming back from that either. So I thought the name of this game was really the red zone offense and the red zone defense. Green Bay being perfect, three touchdowns on three opportunities. The Panthers only getting one touchdown on five opportunities, three field goals. And then of course, the massive turnover on the one yard line. Again, huge credit to Chris Barnes there. So I thought uh, red zone offense, red zone defense, that, that can always be a huge uh, you know swing of the game. And it certainly was that case again. Quick look at injuries, three injuries for players that did not return. Rashawn Gary and Zadarius Smith also suffered injuries at one point, but both of them returned to the game. But the three that we'll want to monitor as we kind of get closer to the Titans game this week, Chris Barnes left with an eye injury, Jamal Williams left with a quad injury, and Will Redman left with a concussion. So 
all three of those players will want to be kind of monitoring uh, as the course of this week goes on. And then really the only player that you're still kind of looking at is uh, Jay Sternberger to see if he comes back from his concussion. And then at some point, Corey Lindsley uh, could potentially return from IR as well. So those are probably the injuries worth watching this week as, as the team starts getting ready for the Tennessee Titans. Very, very quickly, I do want to go over that really interesting call by Matt Rule uh, to kick the field goal on first down. They just completed a 40-yard pass, and it was first and 15 or first and 10 from the 15-yard line. And there's about two minutes, eight seconds ish left, and they decide to kick the field goal. And I love the decision. It's really, really smart to do in this situation. I've I've done this on Madden myself on numerous occasions, and it just makes a ton of sense. And the, the key here was that Carolina only had one timeout left. And the reason that that's so important is because with about two minutes and eight seconds left, you're still on the other side of the two minute warning where you still get that extra stoppage. Assuming you continue to play offense there, you are probably not going to score. You basically give yourself one play to maybe score and still have the two minute warning, but you're really cutting it close. In, in, in this case, you probably are, are, are going to end up scoring and be you know past the two-minute warning, which really takes away that timeout, which is really detrimental because now even in a best-case scenario, you're looking at one timeout, kicking to the Packers, and if everything goes right, if they run three times and you call your one timeout, you're probably getting the ball back with under 20 seconds and still needing a field goal in that situation, and that just makes it really tough with no timeouts. And again, that's in a perfect situation. So when you get to under 20 seconds, it just makes everything super, super difficult. So that's not a direction that you want to go in. So the first option would have been go for a touchdown, hope that you get a touchdown basically immediately, because if you don't, now you're with, now you have to go onside kick. So they would have basically given themselves a window of maybe one or two plays to score a touchdown and then maybe get the ball back down a field goal with about 19 seconds left with no timeouts, and it just would have been a really, really difficult scenario. Option number two is you either get the field goal or the touchdown a little bit later, and then you have to go onside kick because just the the time differential doesn't allow for you to use your one timeout and still get the ball back. So in that situation, you're dependent upon an onside kick, with which with new onside kick rules is is basically a fool's errand. And to, to limit yourself to the only way that you can win is to get an onside kick is not the best strategy. It's not giving your team the appropriate amount of outs in that scenario. So you want to avoid that at all costs. So that only leaves the one other scenario, which is you kick the field goal before the two minute warning, you kick off to Green Bay, and then you still have the two minute warning and your timeout, which means that you could get the ball back with about a minute, you know, around a minute remaining and potentially good field position because you just kicked off. And that's exactly what happened. The only failure here for the Panthers was that huge holding penalty on the punt return, or I guess if you want to look at it, not blocking the punt that was very, very blockable, or at least so it seems. So Carolina ran that to perfection. And the the job of a coach there is to give yourself the most outs possible. And Matt Rule did a glorious job of that. None uh, None of the options that I just mentioned are great options, but he picked the best option for to give his team the most opportunities for success. Ultimately, they got you know down eight points, first and 10 from their own 20-yard line with a minute left and no timeouts. And again, is that a perfect situation? No, but it was the best possible situation given the set of circumstances that they were in. They executed everything almost to perfection besides the hold. And again, it gave them an opportunity to win at the end. And for some reason, Christian Kirksey was covering Curtis Samuel down the middle of the field, which is inexplicable in that situation. But if, if Teddy Bridgewater hits that pass, they may have had a chance to kind of pull that off. So Kudos to Matt Rule for being able to do that, and it's something that I think other teams should copy moving forward if in that situation. That's going to do it for me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Packaday Podcast. You can check out Tyler and Gage on the Packaday Podcast wherever you get your favorite uh, audio podcasts. I'll be right back here tomorrow discussing more of this game, hopefully uh, having some grades if they launch the All-22 on Sunday, which I'm not sure if they will or not, but uh, we'll kind of go from there. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't ready. Check me out tomorrow right back here on YouTube. And until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go!